Father, no matter what the temperature is, uh, we understand that you love us and that uh, it's still a good time to worship. Father, I pray as we lift our hearts together um, in music, in prayer, uh, during reading your word, I just pray that it blesses you. Father, just thank you for all you do in our lives. For its name in Jesus we pray. Amen.
everybody? I needed my hands free, so I put up a uh, mic here. You guys are all, I'm going to have to move it over a little bit, I think, just because you're going this direction instead of this direction today. How's your week been? I had a long week. I drove and drove and drove and drove. Um, Texas is a big state. And if you're going to the east side of it, um, it um, seems forever to get across there. I went to a funeral. A friend, pastor of mine, passed away. His name was Bill McFarland. And he was the first pastor that I served under as a youth pastor. And I worked with him for about five years. And you need to know his name because if you didn't, if you, if it wasn't for him, you probably would not be sitting here right now. Because one of the things he taught me was children's time. And that was like the first church I ever went to that they had a children's time where kids came up on the stage and, you know, and, and, um, participated in the uh, in the service so uh, he did that and I learned under under him to do that and so about I think it's been 20 something years ago that we started it here and uh, he left Tucson shortly after I did and that church still does children's time but uh, I want to show you a children's time that he did and this is like I was trying to think of what children's time really sticks out in my mind with him and this is the only one that I can actually do um, so I will I'll show it uh, to you and he would tell Bible stories and so today I'm going to tell you a Bible story and this is found in Joshua chapter 9 and 10 and in chapter 9 basically Joshua has been told when they left Egypt he said you know and they, they crossed over in, into the, um, the Jordan says, I want you to go in and conquer the people that are there. And that was Joshua's mission. And so if you read, you ever heard the story of Jericho, where they walked around the walls, seven days, Sunday school, it's really important to come, <laughs> okay? Um, I'm, me I'm meeting adults that don't know these stories because they haven't been in church, you know, their entire lives. And so, but... Um, one of the things that God says, I want you to drive all the people out of the uh, land. And uh, there was one town that tricked Joshua. And basically Joshua made a pact with them or a, an agreement with them that he would not attack them. And they were like, cool. So, uh, but there were some other kings, some Amorites. And the Amorites basically said, we need to go attack that town and take care of those people. And so... Um, they decided to do that. But uh, before I start there, we're going to pretend something here. This is the sun. And what happens in the morning? It comes up, right? And then it goes down, right? And the next day it comes back up and it goes back down. Well, Joshua heard that they were attacking his friends. And he basically said, let's go down and take care of the Amorites. And so he comes down, and, you know, the day starts, and it's going along there. And what happened was, during the battle, Joshua says there's not enough time in the day. Now, I don't have this power. Uh, there's a lot of days I'd like, okay, I just need a couple more hours. But Joshua, here's what Joshua did. As the day started, Joshua goes... God, I need more time. Can you stop the sun? And the sun stopped in place. And it stayed there for a whole day. And when the battle was done, the sun set. So, what's the point? God is powerful. I don't even know how he does that. I mean, physics-wise, but God can do anything. And Joshua trusted God, knew that his purpose was to drive the people out of the land, and depended upon God, and God says, I'm going to take care of the battle for you. In fact, in part of the battle, it says that God caused confusion, where they kind of fought against themselves, and then he, then he sent hailstones and killed people in the, in the battle uh, to help out. 
So remember, you can depend on God. He's faithful. He's trustworthy. And he can do incredible things, even in your life. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you. I thank you for Bill and his legacy that he leaves behind. And uh, Father, just for all the children that he's touched over the years. And Father, I thank you for our church and our uh, understanding that kids are important. These young ladies and young men are going to grow up to know you, Lord. Father, I just pray that um, we depend on you as we live our lives. And Father, I just thank you, thank you that you can do so many things even in our lives. For its name in Jesus we pray. Amen. Yes. Thank you, Ted. We do appreciate Bill's legacy because we appreciate you coming forward and doing children's church every single week, or children's time. Um, a while ago in our study of Luke that we did, we came across a section where it was, Luke was really trying to come up with different stories and put them together in one spot to prove to us that Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the the king. Whether you acknowledge him as such or not, he is the Lord. And at the beginning of this little section where he's trying to show that Jesus is the Lord, um, there's a story where um, Luke shows us that Jesus is the Lord of the storm. And the story is, you know, Jesus gets his disciples into a boat and they're going across the Sea of Galilee and Jesus is wiped out. He's sleeping in the back and all of a sudden this gale just comes and and hits the boat, and, and it's nearly swamped. And Luke tells us that they were in very serious danger. Um, it wasn't just a, uh, the disciples were being cowardly and chicken when they were worried about they were going to die. They were professional fishermen. They could read the circumstances, and they could see they are in serious, serious danger. And so uh, they're, they're a little worried. Now, it's probably a tribute to how hard Jesus was working and the fact that even though they're in the middle of this gale in the Sea of Galilee, Jesus is still sleeping in the back of the boat. I mean, it's like the equivalent of sleeping on the back of a bucking bronco, and he's still out cold. And so the disciples, they go back, and they're like, Jesus, wake up! We're going to die here! And Jesus, he wakes up, and he kind of shakes the cobwebs out of his head. I don't know if you've ever been awakened right in the middle of the night when you're in the deepest part of your sleep. It's really hard to start functioning. So he kind of shakes himself around, and he, and he stands up in the boat that's just tossing on this storm, and, and he says, peace, be still. That's it. I mean, there's probably wouldn't make a really exciting movie because there's, like, no buildup, no, like, begging his father to hear his cry. And after he does it, he doesn't sink to his knees as if it took so much power to overwhelm the storm. He just stands up in the middle of the tossing boat, and he basically says, hey, Knock it off. Some of us are trying to sleep here. And immediately, the storm is done. His disciples are amazed. Who is this? All he does is speak an immediate peace in the middle of the storm. Jesus is the Lord of the storm. Can I just encourage you with that? If you don't get anything else that we're talking about today, hang on to that. Jesus is the Lord of the storm. You know, just yesterday, I think it was, Jen was telling me, I, mean, I don't know if you remember Natalie a few weeks ago, she got up and she told you this testimony of this girl named uh, Twin, uh, what's that? Theodros, yes. Uh, twin Theodros, that she lives in Eritrea, and she was in prison, and she deliberately went back to prison in order to... Um, witness to the other prisoners that God had in there. And she had a chance for freedom, but she didn't feel like God was allowing her to experience freedom, so she went back to prison. And Eritrea was one of the, just one of the countries that is really down on evangelical Christians. Just this last week, the government decided to release 70 of them. Jesus is the Lord of the storm. Now, this is one of the reasons why we are having a Jason Gray concert here. 
Um, if you see in your bulletin, I, I came a little bit late, so I don't know if uh, Ted Pate announces that it's actually on the 7th and not on the 8th of April, but it's going to be in our South parking lot. Why are we doing that when everybody else is shutting down and everybody else is saying, ah, we need to just not uh, get around each other too much? It's because in the middle of the despair and the despondency and the fear, we want to proclaim this message loudly, give encouragement, give hope, give victory of Jesus is the Lord of the storm. When Dan Cole first came forward, said, Fred, we need this, please. And he's even willing to put some of his own efforts and some of his own resources toward it. That's why, because Jesus is the Lord of the storm, and we want everybody to know it's what we need. While we're all tuned into the radios to see what the president's doing now, while we're looking at the world scene, it's what's going on now. Jesus is the Lord of the storm. Now, last week, we started a study, a two-week study, this is the last week of it, of who is the Antichrist. Now, we looked at some characteristics of who this guy is going to be last week. We're going to look at a couple more characteristics today, but really, we're going to also see what is he going to do. But before we get into this topic about this guy who is possessed by Satan himself, and is going to bring a storm upon the whole world. I just want to have it lodged in our brains. No matter what he's going to do, Jesus is the Lord of the storm. I might just, just break out into that randomly, spontaneously throughout the sermon. Jesus is the Lord of the storm because I want you to hang on to it. But let's find out more about this guy who's coming. If you can turn with me to Revelation. Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. Revelation being the very last book of your Bible, verses 1 through 4. We read this last week. We're reading it again just to kind of remind ourselves, refresh ourselves, and get into today. John seeing this vision, and he says, I saw a beast rising out of the sea. I think that's interesting. We started on an on a, uh, introduction of the disciples were freaked out about this storm that came out of the sea. Here's another storm that comes out of the sea, but this sea isn't literal. It's probably referring to the Mediterranean Sea, but that's just a way of saying that this guy is a Gentile, um, from coming from the Gentile nations. He saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads with ten diadems, or ten crowns on its horns, and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's. Its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have, seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And we talked about last week what it meant that this thing looks a little bit like a leopard with bear's paws and a lion's mouth. That's a, a nod to the fact that he's going to have aspects of it from these different kingdoms that we've seen in our past history. Um, he's going to look a little bit like Alexander the Great's Greece. He's going to have aspects within him of ancient Medes and the Persians, and he's going to have the boldness and the arrogance a little bit of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. So we talked about that last week. What I really want to kind of zone in on today is the fact that this thing has seven heads. And one of these heads has a mortal wound that looks like it's been healed, and that just all by itself causes everybody to be amazed and, and to wonder. And that's such a major aspect for John. He mentions that like three or four different times. The world was amazed because his, his wound, he, he healed from this mortal wound. What is that? Well, John tells us a little bit more. He clarifies for us just a little bit. Not enough for my taste, but he does tell us a little bit more about what this thing is with the seven heads in Revelation chapter 17. So if you can look to chapter 17, verses 6 through 8, this is what he says. 
And I saw the woman, this is a great harlot named Babylon, drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to her, why do you marvel? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. So John, he's just standing there, mouth agape, looking at this beast with the seven heads, and it has a skanky harlot sitting on top of it. And the angel tells John, why are you marveling? Apparently, John shouldn't have been surprised as much as he was to see what he was seeing. He should have already recognized a little bit what he was seeing, but he didn't. And the angel's like, why are you marveling? This is the beast that was and is not, and is to come. So apparently this isn't something that's brand new. This is something that has been seen in one form or another before. And it wasn't in existence right then, but it was coming again. In other words, John, you shouldn't be surprised. You should recognize this thing because if you've been paying attention, you would know it's been around in world history before. Now, what is this angel talking about? Is it a form of government that used to be around and it was coming again like imperialism or something? Is it a particular nation? Is it a cultural mindset? Is it a particular historical character? Here's the bad news. The angel doesn't say. Here's the good news. We can still apply it. You know, right, that all throughout human history since the very beginning, God has preserved a revelation of himself, his ways, and his standards. My God does not stutter. All throughout human history, he has made it very, very, very clear, this is right and this is wrong. Even if you were in a culture that didn't know how to read and you didn't have scriptures, he still wrote it on every human heart. This is right and this is wrong. And I just got to believe that if people would have clung to that, if all these cultures would have clung to who God is and his standards and his morality and his definition of right and wrong, that he would do the work of protecting us from any kind of the beast in any form. But what have we done ever since the very beginning? We forsake what God clearly says is right and wrong, and we exchange that for Satan's latest temptation, which is really not the latest temptation at all. All it is is a rehashing of what he came up with a very long time ago. It's just that we're so stupid, we keep running for it. We keep falling for the exact same worn out tricks and because of that he's going to be able to bring forward a beast that apparently he's already brought forward before and this beast will gain such power so many times when you read about any kind of indication of the antichrist whether you're reading in daniel or whether you're reading in thessalonians or you're reading in revelation there's always some little phrase in there that is coming about in the midst of the rebellion. In other words, people are already rebelling against God on a massive scale. The beast doesn't lead you to do that. We're already doing that. And because we're already doing that, because we've already brought such confusion and such division into our own lives by insisting on doing things our own way, it's like this vacuum to where the beast is just able to step in and say, don't worry, you messed up your lives, I'll save you, I'll take it from here. And because of just the way God works, there's sometimes where he'll say, you know what, I'm going to let him do that. Whatever, beast of, whatever form the beast is coming, He's been here before. He's coming again. Our job 
is to read this. Learn this. Meditate on this. And if we would fill our lives with this and follow this, we can be strong enough to where when whatever beast is coming, whatever he looks like, he just doesn't get a grip on us. Because we're refusing to follow for Satan's same old tricks again. Now, it is interesting what he says these seven heads are. So we're going to keep reading in chapter 17, verses 9 through 10. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. Okay. This one actually isn't too hard. It gets confusing. This one isn't too bad. That word mountains can also be translated as hills. And when the angel basically says, this is seven hills, that would be basically the equivalent of me telling you, let me tell you a little vision or a parable about the big apple. When I say the big apple, what are you immediately thinking of? New York City. Rome was known as a city of seven hills. And so the, the angel says this, John writes this down, that's what his, his original audience would have immediately thought of. Somehow, this beast has to do with Rome. Somehow, Rome is going to have a, it's going to characterize this entity that's coming back someday. But this isn't the only time that the Bible gives this kind of an indication. If you can turn with me to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. Keep your finger, though, in Revelation, because we're going back there again. Daniel chapter 9, this is found on page 747, if you're following along in your foyer Bible. Page 747, or it's to the right of Psalms. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. Verse 24. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks." Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. Now I don't have a hard, long time to talk about the... 70 weeks, what that means, the interpretation that I think is true. This is what I want you to focus on. After this appointed period of time, this anointed one is going to be cut off and he's going to have nothing. And if you do the math according to what I think Daniel was having in his vision, what he was foreseeing down to the exact year was the crucifixion of Jesus. It's amazing. Hundreds of years previously, Daniel nails it down to the exact year on the calendar of when Jesus is going to get crucified. But then he says, after this, the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, which in the Bible that usually means the temple. Well, know that at this time, Daniel didn't have a temple in Jerusalem. It had already been destroyed when Nebuchadnezzar came and burned down the whole thing. And so this is talking about the time when it was going to be rebuilt, Jerusalem was going to be rebuilt, and it was going to be destroyed by the people of the prince who is to come, who were, who destroyed it in A.D. 70? The Romans. The Romans were the people of the prince who is to come. Well, who is that? Well, Daniel's just spent the last two chapters talking about the prince who is to come. It's the Antichrist. So who are the people of the Antichrist? It's the Romans. So basically, this angel was saying, Daniel, or John, hold on to your hat. The Romans, they might go through this period of time to where they are not. 
but they're making a comeback. They're going to come back, and the whole world is going to be amazed when they're reestablished and with the power that they're going to experience. Now, it is kind of interesting. The, the angel kind of switches. I mean, he uses the same symbols of the seven heads, but all of a sudden he gives another definition of them, building upon the fact that this is some kind of a Roman entity. But then he says something else. So flip back with me again to Revelation chapter 17. This is what he says. Verses 10 and 11. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he does, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. So these seven heads aren't just the seven hills, they're also seven kings. And the five of these kings have already passed on. One is in existence when John's having this vision, and one is still coming. Now, here's a little bit of Fred theory. First of all, Fred theory meaning, I might be wrong. Some day God might really say, Fred, what are you thinking? But I think he understands because he made it confusing. <laughs> but here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking since this is based on something Roman, these seven kings, it makes sense to me that they would be seven Roman kings or Roman emperors. And it is intriguing to me. I had to look up a little bit of Roman history on the internet, and this is what I found. Here you go. This is on the screen. This is an artist's rendition of the beast that I just thought was cool. Um, but I'm the one that labeled it because I just wanted some kind of a visual to come where we can kind of keep track of what's going on. But do you know that from the beginning of the uh, New Testament to the time of John, there were involved these six Roman emperors, Augustus, Caligula, Nero, Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian. Now, there were actually more than these six. I picked these six out of the 11 that there were in that period of time because they set themselves apart. They distinguished themselves somehow. There's something that made Augustus, Caligula, Nero, Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian different than all the other emperors of their era. Do you know what made them different in the same way that the Antichrist is going to be different? These guys had the nerve to say, I am am a god and by the way it would be wonderful if you worshiped me as a god did you catch when chapter 13 john said that they all have blasphemous names written on them what could be more blasphemous than you standing in god's face and saying oh by the way i'm you these guys all said they were God, and just guess how many had died by the time that John had this vision. Five. Remember the angel said, five of them are gone. One of them is in existence now. So at this point, Augustus, Caligula, Nero, Vespasian, and Titus, they were gone. Domitian, he was still in control right now. As a matter of fact, he's the one that threw John on the island of Patmos in the first place. So there is one that is, and there's one that's still coming. And that one that's still coming is one that's so confusing. I put on the initial reign of the Antichrist. And this is why I say that, because the angel says something <laughs> really it's like, what? If you want to reveal something, why don't you speak a little plainer? But he says, you know, um, it's an eighth king that's yet still part of the seven. So how can he be the seventh king and an eighth king at the same time? Well, if you add that little morsel of confusing information to what it says about Revelation chapter 13, where it says that one of the seven heads received a mortal wound, but he was healed, and he just makes the world so amazed. Well, then you kind of have the theory that became very popular through Tim LaHaye in the Left Behind series. Anybody in here read Left Behind series? Watch some of the movies? All right. Um, he's a dispensationalist, so you already know what I think about Tim LaHaye. 
<laughs> I'm probably not going to. I, I, I think he's a great Bible teacher, but there's a lot that he and I are really not going to agree on. So, but I'm going to tell you his theory, though. His theory is um, that the Antichrist, he is going to be assassinated by a literal sword. And uh, the, the Satan is going to come along, and he is going to possess the Antichrist and resurrect him from the dead, like literally bring him back to life. And the world is going to be so amazed that that's what's going to give him so much power over every nation in the world. And so what Tim LaHaye would say to this is, well, he was the seventh king in that he was like any other Roman emperor. But then when he died and he came back, he came back as a totally different king because now he's supernatural. Now he's possessed by Satan himself. And so that sets him apart to also be not just the seventh king, but now he's also the eighth king that's going to take over the whole world. Now, here's the one reason why I don't like that. And I don't write bestsellers. So, I mean, who am I? But here's what I don't like about it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul said Christianity rises and falls based, based upon one particular belief. What is that? What's so important to our doctrine that if you take that out, you don't even have Christianity anymore. The resurrection. This is what Jesus uses to prove that he's God. This is what Jesus uses to prove that his sacrifice was acceptable to his father. This is what Jesus proves or uses to prove that he can raise you from the dead someday is the fact that he was able to raise himself from the dead someday. And I just get a little icky in my stomach thinking that God's going to give Satan the power to do the same kind of thing that sets Jesus up as proof that he's God. I just feel blasphemous somehow. So what else could it be then? I mean, that made so much sense. What else could it be if it weren't the resurrection? Well, there is Daniel chapter 11, which we're not going to read it this morning just because we don't have time, but it is very interesting reading when talking about this because Daniel, in detail, is describing the rain ahead of time of this guy by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Now, some of you, you hear a historical figure like that, you're like, I don't care about history, this is dumb, this is boring, move on. But if you were a Jew, this would be big for you. Um, because, you know, Hanukkah, what they celebrate during our Christmas time, Antiochus Epiphanes IV is the main bad guy that de got defeated for why they have Hanukkah. I mean, he is the boogeyman of their history. He's right up there with Hitler and Stalin. They talk about Hitler and Stalin. They also talk about Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes IV. He was one bad dude. He was such a major character to the Jewish people that Daniel spent an entire chapter talking about this guy. And he lived and reigned during the intertestamental period, between the Old Testament and the, Old, and the New Testament, uh, between Malachi and Matthew. So you're not going to read a lot of uh, history in the Bible about him. All you read in the Bible is prophecy that he's coming. But he actually, you can only read about what he did in the history books. And this I got from uh, 2 Maccabees, which isn't scripture, it's in the Catholic Bible. It's not scripture, it's not inspired by God, but it's still really interesting history. And you read this guy and you see, man, Daniel nailed it. He, he like started talking about this guy and every single event that he brought up in this guy's life, it came true. But what's really interesting is at the end of this one chapter, Daniel does this weird, funky thing is he starts talking about Antiochus and the Antichrist interchangeably. As if you, can learn, if you can learn about the reign of this one guy, you would also learn about the reign of the other. When you see the Antichrist, there's a reason why the angel said, you should recognize this Jewish John, because you've seen something like this before. So what did Antiochus do that could look like a resurrection from the dead. Well, first of all, um, at the beginning of his reign, he is very, very successful. 
And I'm intrigued by the fact that the way that he got in with the Jewish people was he used the ministry of a false prophet, a high priest named Menelaus. And Menelaus wanted to get in good with Antiochus because uh, he wanted the power of the high priesthood. So he uh, dedicated all this money to Antiochus, and he ended up leading all of Israel to following Antiochus as their king. And Antiochus, he got in good with the people by being a good liar. He was a master of intrigue, and he deceived a whole nation into thinking that he was exactly who they needed. But Antiochus, he got a little greedy, and he wanted more power, so he attacked Egypt for the second time. The first time he did it, he was very successful. He plundered Egypt, carried off all kinds of treasures. He got very rich, so he decided, I'm going to do it again. So he goes and attacks Egypt again, but the second time, we learn from the book of 2 Maccabees, he gets spanked. Just like Daniel predicted, if you read Daniel chapter 11, Rome gets a call from Egypt that says, help us. And Rome sends these ships over and he stops Antiochus in his tracks and he gets spanked so bad that the rumor actually reaches Israel, Antiochus is dead. Now all these people in Israel, they're like, well, we didn't like him anyway. Uh, he, we followed him for a while because of this false prophet, but we didn't really trust him. So now let's get rid of the false prophet since Antiochus is gone. So they start working against Menelaus. And to their dismay, Antiochus wasn't really dead. He shows up suddenly at the city gates and says, Hey, why are you mess messing with my high priest? And he just goes on this killing spree. Every single Jew he comes across, he slaughters them. Man, woman, child, with the help of his false prophet, he plunders the temple. He takes all its treasures, and he commits what Daniel refers to as an abomination of desolation. And he sets in the middle of the temple this big statue of Zeus and says, this is now your God, worship him. So you see with this that it looked like Antiochus was dead, that he experienced this mortal wound for war, but actually he comes back in full power. He's restored, and everybody's amazed. How did he do that? Now, would you see why I would think, Bible students like me also think, that if you see and learn about Antiochus, you can learn a whole lot about the Antichrist because doesn't a lot of his stories sound familiar? Just like, the Anti or just like Antiochus, the Antichrist is going to start out very, very successful. Just like Antiochus, the Antichrist is going to use the ministry of a false prophet to deceive the entire nation of Israel. And chances are this false prophet is even going to be a Jew. You know, if you read Revelation chapter 13, whereas the beast comes from the Gentile sea, the second beast, this, this creature that has like two horns and in the mouth of a dragon, but he looks like a lamb and he's the false prophet, he comes from the land. And some Bible teachers say, well, that means that he's a Jew leading his own people astray, trying to get them to follow the Antichrist, just like Menelaus tried to get his people to follow Antiochus. And if it follows the pattern, chances are what's going to happen is the Antichrist in his quest for power, he's going to wage war to try to get more and more glory and more and more uh, influence and more and more riches. But maybe he's going to get spanked. Maybe he's going to get spanked so bad that it's going to look like he gets killed. To where the Jews are like, well, good, we don't want him anyway. Let's get rid of the influence of him in our country. But to their surprise, he's going to come back. And I think that could be when Daniel chapter 9 happens to where it talks about how the people made this covenant with the Antichrist for a period of seven years. And right in the middle, he just breaks it. He sets up this abomination of desolation that Paul describes in 2 Thessalonians to where he doesn't set up a statue of Zeus. He sets up himself. Where he's like, hey, who are you to rebel against me? I'm God. And then he just goes on this rampage, slaughtering Jews left and right to where it is the worst time of tribulation the nation of Israel has ever 
experienced. And this is what I believe Jesus was referring to in Luke chapter 21, to where he basically describes, you know, this guy is going to come and bring a living hell upon your heads. If you can turn with me to Luke 21. Luke 21, starting with verse 20. This is found on page 881. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart, and let not those who are out in the country enter it. For these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, when Lou preached for us a few weeks ago, a few months ago, um, he talked about this, about how in a way this has already happened. He's absolutely right. In A.D. 70, the, Romes, the Romans came against Jerusalem, and it was horrible. I mean, they burned down the temple. They slaughtered Jewish citizens in the street. Like a million Jews died during this. A million, a million innocent Jewish men, women, and children were slaughtered in the streets, and their blood just flowed. So absolutely this is referring to that. And because people didn't believe Jesus, they were part of the slaughter. If they would have listened to what he had to have said, what he was saying, um, just as soon as uh, they saw things going on, they would have, they would have run. Uh, and they would have run to the mountains like Jesus did. And anybody that did that, they were saved. But anybody that didn't believe Jesus thought they could save Jerusalem. They were slaughtered in the streets. It was It was horrible. But I don't think that's the full fulfillment of this passage. Why? Because he says here, Jesus says that um, Jerusalem's going to be surrounded by armies. In AD 70, they were only attacked by Rome and whoever Rome could recruit. But it's really only one army. Someday it's going to be armies. And Zechariah chapters 12, 13, and 14 clarifies for us, someday Jerusalem is going to be surrounded by every nation in the world. And that has not happened yet. It's going to be bad. It's going to be horrific. I personally don't think that we're going to be, you and I, Christian, are going to be involved in this, that we're going to be surrounded in Jerusalem. I think we already got our hands full because all the nations hate us wherever we are. This is in particular an attack against the Jewish people to where the Antichrist is just going to vent his rage but can I just go back to where we began? Jesus is the Lord of the storm. You know, the end of Revelation talks about how Jesus isn't going to put, that, put up with that forever. He is going to stand just like he stood in that boat. He's going to come down. Everybody's going to see him come down. And he is just going to speak. He doesn't have to go around swinging swords and act like make a ninja guy. He doesn't need his armies that are riding in behind him. They're just there to watch. All he has to do is speak. And immediately, the Antichrist is brought down. All the storm, all the wrath that he's causing, all the trouble is immediately stilled. And Jesus brings his peace. I know, privately, maybe not so privately, some of you are like, Fred, why do you keep talking about this stuff? We don't care. We don't really understand it. It's weird. It's beyond us. Why talk about it? If I can just say as humbly as I can, as lovingly as I can, as your pastor, if you believe that way, you're wrong. And you need to repent. <laughs> right? I mean, J Jen, just this morning, she showed me in this little kid's book. 
um, that she was uh, reading uh, to see if this was, somebody gave it to us, and she was making sure it was okay to read to the kids that didn't have any heresy in it. And on the very first page, it says there's only one real God, and the Bible is God's word. And so to think about, the Bible's God's word. Do you love the Bible? And we teach this to our kids in Sunday school, but then we don't really believe it. We love the concept of the Bible, but we don't love everything in the Bible. We pick and choose. We like our John 3.16, our Romans 3.28, or 3.23, Romans 3.20, or 6.23. We love our 1 John 1.9. We love our Romans 10.9 and 10, and our Ephesians 2.8 and 9. But that's about as far as we need to go. The scripture all throughout its pages is talking about this stuff, and we're like, eh, I don't care. God spent so much ink trying to make sure that we understood the signs when we see them. That we'll have this, this realm of knowledge that we can pass on to our kids and they can pass on to their kids as a church so that when it actually happens, there will be a core of people that say, I see what's going on here. But yet I look at our churches and I'm not seeing a desire to know this stuff that God spent so much. And he didn't just bring this in a couple of passages. I mean, this stuff is all throughout Scripture. And we say, I don't care. Now, my greatest frustration as a pastor is not people's ignorance. Ignorance I can deal with. That gives me job security. Now I have something to teach. What I can't handle is apathy. Don't tell me. I don't care about this stuff. It's boring. What do you do with that? God deliberately put all this stuff that he intends us to meditate on and study so that when we see it, we're not going to get swept away like it says is going to happen so, to so many people inside the church. You know, so many people, they're all about the emotionalism of Christianity. Just give me the practical. Just give me the experiential. And do you know the Antichrist is going to be great at that? He's going to look like he's the answer to so many problems in your practical life. He's going to look like he can feed you emotionally. He's going to be charming. He's going to look good. Satan is a great liar. And to all these apathetic, ignorant Christians that don't even know what God spent so much time writing about, he's going to look good, and they're going to get swept away with everybody else. And God's like, no, not you. You learn this stuff. You meditate this stuff. You hold on to this stuff and teach it to your kids for crying out loud. Enough to where they can teach it to their kids so that when it happens, there's a core that will stand faithful to me when everybody else is led astray. Saying that, yes, we need to study this stuff, but we've got to be careful about focusing only on the bad of this stuff. Yes, learn about who the Antichrist is going to be so that you can recognize him, so that you can recognize his spirit that's alive and active today. But don't forget, Jesus is the Lord of the storm. He's not up in heaven biting his fingernails and saying, oh, I hope the bad guys don't mess up everything I have planned. I hope they don't hurt my people too badly. He knows someday at the appointed time that my father has said, I'm coming. I'm going to speak one thing, and that's going to stop it all. Jesus is the Lord of the storm. And probably, hopefully, you and I are not going to live to see the day of the Antichrist. I just really hope that's true. But it's still worth studying, not only to teach your children, but just because you can see illustrated by studying it, Jesus' power. And if you can believe that Jesus has the power to stop the most amazing, powerful, awe-inspiring entity that the world can possibly conjure, you know that Jesus is also capable of handling whatever you're going through right now. If he can handle the Antichrist 
and a one world government that dominates every nation on the planet, he can handle the storm of your finances. He can handle the storm that is your family. He can handle that health scare. He's not up there biting his nails. Oh no, what do we do? What do we do? He's got this. So the question is, are you giving yourself to the Lord of the storm or are you giving yourself to the best that the world has to offer? The best that the world has to offer and the greatest solution they have will someday create an antichrist. And all he's going to do is bring misery. Jesus brings peace. Jesus brings life just by speaking it. So I close the same way I close every week. Do you know Jesus? Have you said, Jesus, these waves are too big for me? That wind is absolutely terrifying to me. I trust you. I, I know you're not ignoring me. I know you see everything I'm going through. I trust you. Take my life. Forgive me of all my sin. Give me this newness, this freshness, and blank slate, a clean slate, so I can follow you. A broken heart and a contrite spirit, God cannot deny. Anybody who repents, anybody who seeks him, will find him. So have you said that to Jesus? Have you told him, oh man, I totally want to follow you. Do it. He's there listening. If you do it, you'll know from other verses it was actually his idea. And the only reason you're doing it is because he called you first. You're not begging him permission. You're not trying to bang down his door. You're just doing what he already wanted you to do. He's ready. He's anxious. Come. Let me pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, we do look at this stuff. And some of it, granted, it's scary stuff. I get why Natalie says, I don't particularly like talking about this stuff. I don't either. There's a lot of scariness, but we just take such hope in. You can handle it. And you can handle my scary that I go through right now. God, first of all, for anybody that's really going through it this morning and they're your kid, maybe it's financial issues. Maybe it's family issues. Maybe it's just fear of health. Maybe it's um, fear of just where the world is going. God, I pray that they can rest this morning in who Jesus really is, the Lord of the storm. I pray that they can just find peace there. But if there is anybody in here, God, that does not know you yet, they've never dedicated themselves to you, they've never surrendered themselves to you, um, God, I pray that they can learn who you are today. I pray that you grip their heart, take over their life, and give them a whole new perspective. We love you so much. Thank you for your patience, and thank you that you loved us first. In Jesus' name, amen.